Good evening and a very warm welcome to First Issues. At the beginning of each year, some people get busy setting personal, health and even financial goals from the short to the long term, while others simply don't. When it comes to money, people have an array of excuses they put forward to explain away the poor management of their finances. And instead of taking control, they rather become vulnerable to each passing whim and circumstance. Do you believe you can have a healthy, fruitful relationship with your money? Do you think it is possible to begin each year without the financial strain that most people complain about in January? Do you know that you can have money in your pocket regardless of which week of the month it is? Or are you currently racking your brain as to how to get out of debts you accumulated trying to fix the mess you made the month before? Over the next few weeks, we here at First Issues, with the help of Bona Life CEO Regina Sikalesilevaka, will attempt to give you the right mindset for managing your finances, with the hopes of sparing you some stress and from making further mistakes. Welcome back to First Issues as we discuss personal finance with Regina Sikalesilevaka. Getting a grip on your finances can be difficult for some and easy for others, but it is something that can have far-reaching consequences for you and your family's prosperity for generations to come. Unfortunately, it is not something we are typically taught in school or even at home because of the cultural belief that children should not handle money. And most Botswana only come in contact with money in early adulthood when the game of catch-up truly begins. Botswana was one of the fastest growing countries in the world at one point and the generation before mine knows little about how to navigate the job unavailability and insecurity, exorbitant property prices and other economic challenges Botswana now face. An environment our commentator says we must first take into account before we can map out an effective plan and vision for our finances. We've just come out of the budget speech and we've heard from the budget speech that there has been a slowdown in the growth of the economy in the country. But there are certain things that are contributing towards that. At a global level, you find that uh, the, the price of minerals has come down and the global economy is not doing as well as it used to do. And because Botswana is relying so much on diamond um, revenue, it's been impacted by what is happening in those other markets. What we've seen is that there hasn't been a creation of new jobs. Youth employment um, continues to be a huge challenge for the, for the country. And the overall result is that the economy hasn't grown at the rate at which it was projected to grow. Now what happens in an environment like that is that businesses struggle to stay in control and some of them ultimately um, scale down or shut down. I think you know there's um, issues around um, BCL, there's issues of um, mines shutting down in Botswana. So the overall picture for the economy of Botswana is not looking positive going forward. So what does this mean for me as I am planning uh, my future and my finances? How does uh, the environment affect how I go about doing things? Well, the environment de determines the type of life that you live. If the economy is doing well, there's a certain level of security and there's a certain level of guarantee in terms of what you can achieve. But if the economy is not doing well, it means that the level of security comes down so that there's no guarantee that in the next five years you're going to have a good job. There's no guarantee that you will be employed until retirement age because things start to, to get uncertain. So what it does mean is that if you're already employed, if you're already in a job, you are lucky. It's no longer something that you can take for granted as you used to be in the past. But what it also means is that if you are in a job, you should start thinking about the future and thinking about what if this job came to an end? What if this company shuts down? What if I am retrenched? Those are the type of questions and that is the type of mindset that somebody should have or somebody should develop when your economy starts slowing down. So in this time of uncertainty, 
where you're saying people should um, ask themselves questions about whether they will have gainful employment in five years or so. Are you saying we should forego um, major financial long-term commitments or that we should save more? How does this affect our planning? I think the thing is that there are certain things that you can't get away from, you know, which we call your needs. You have to make sure that you are catering for those needs. You've got to have uh, clothing, food, and shelter. Those are basic. But within those um, needs as well, you need to be looking at your affordability range. Instead of buying a house um, that costs you one million, you could be looking at a house that costs you 800,000 because in the wider scheme of things, you'll be able to afford the cheaper house. So um, the basic needs must be catered for. And then you should look at your wants and really um, interrogate those ones. I want this. Do I really need it? No, I don't need it. And if I want it, why do I want it? If I get rid of it, is my life going to come to a standstill and be able to juggle it like that? So it's really a question of being more um, conscious of what we are doing and how we're doing and why we're doing it instead of just automatically going out and buying things as and when you please. So it does call for people to review the type of things that they're using their money on. It does call on people to review the actual amount of the things that we're spending our money on and to look at it in relation to the income that you are, that you are, that you are earning instead of looking at it in relation to what other people are doing and what you want to do and how things have always been done. I think a lot of people model um, what they should be doing at different life stages as to um, on what their parents were doing. That's exactly it, because um, human beings are very, get into a comfort zone. So when you've been doing something long enough or when something has been happening in society long enough, it becomes our comfort zone. And sometimes our comfort zones are actually very uncomfortable. But there are our comfort zones because that's what we are used and we're accustomed to. So when things become uncertain, when things change, you also have to change. You have to move out of that com comfort zone and move into something that is more practical and that's more applicable to your reality. So if it's always been the norm that, um, you know, as Botswana, this is what we do, and we've been doing it without thinking, now is the time to think about it and say, okay, this is what we do, but is it sustainable? Is it adding value? Is it actually making us better people or is it making us people that are, are subtracting value from our lives? So basically, I think it means we have to be a lot more thoughtful of what we are doing and how we are doing it. And I must say to you that it's coming without us thinking, it's coming automatically because I'm seeing that People when they're in the supermarkets, I've seen people at the checkout till actually taking some few items out of the basket. And I've seen other people um, replacing things on the shelves and taking the cheaper version. So it's, it's slowly coming, but we just need to accelerate it by consciously bringing it to the fore of our minds. So that when you've got two brands of milk standing next to each other, you know that this milk is still milk look at the price and take the cheaper version. As we conclude our conversation, Mystica Lesilevaka reminds us that these changes in the economy occur somewhat gradually. Therefore, we cannot anticipate overnight improvements in the current state of affairs. An economy is not something that just changes within a day or a week. It's something that changes gradually. So if your economy is starting to go down, it's probably going to be going down for the next couple of years before it starts to pick again. So it's, it's, um, it's something that we can't sit on and say, oh no, maybe next year. You need to make sure that when you start seeing the tide turning, you don't know how long it's going to take, but it may be a gradual process. So you need to make the instant change and anticipate uh, what is coming along, uh, along the way so that you are always a step ahead. And that makes for the first installment of our conversation with Ms. Sikale Selevaga on personal finances. 
Up next on the program, however, we take a look at Indian business etiquette practices to better prepare us for those more intercultural exchanges. Welcome back. As in this portion of our program, we pick up on our series on business etiquette practices from around the globe as we are adamant that in our increasingly globalized world, intercultural exchanges, regardless of the career path you may have chosen, are bound to take place. And it would be best if we are all a little more culturally savvy to smoothen said interactions. Tonight we look at India. As the world's second most populous nation with more than one billion people, it is projected to become one of the world's biggest economies. It is tipped by PricewaterhouseCoopers to draw nearly level with the United States by 2050. Locally, the Central Statistics Office recorded 72.2 million US dollars worth of imports from India from between November 2013 and October 2014, and over 1.1 billion in exports from Botswana to India in the same period. Indian companies such as Tata Consultancy Services in the IT sector, Bank of Baroda in financial services, Mahindra in the automobile industry, and NIIT in the education sector have their offices in Botswana. The Indian Business Chamber of Commerce and Industries Chairman Gopal Adanki joins us now to tell us what business practices can be considered unique to India. Well, Indian businessmen seem to be the most successful business icons in the world today. I first go for the value system from which they come from. You know, India has got 5,000 years of history with diverse cultures, caste, color, creed and community. Traditionally, Indian businesses were run by families who were closely knitted with the value system. Of late, the management schools have brought in lots of successful leaders to the globe, but still they have an Indian instinct when they do their business. Indian businessmen are very hospitable. They start their business not by asking the terms of value. They greet, they comfort you, and then they take you to the business board. And their negotiation is precision and their value for money concept is globally accepted. Today, if you see the Indian Prime Minister, I think he is, is a world icon in trying to market the nation to bring the foreign direct investment. Indians, as business community, if you would like to say, specifically communities like Gujaratis, our Prime Minister happened to be a Gujarati, they are very successful global icons today. And they have shown their record of success in various spheres of economy, both in India and outside also. If you say unique quality, our value system, our culture, our tradition, it plays in fact for any human behavior, when you grow wise in life, these characters will come out and play their real genuine role. So if I was to conduct business with you and start by talking about the money before anything else, that would be a faux pas in India. That wouldn't be too well accepted. It's better to start off cordially. Well, uh, the, the person other side would not take it as a fault or a foul, but when an Indian businessman starts, he would first make you comfortable so that there is a wavelength of the exact proposal which you are going to initiate. Negotiation is a long-term process. Business is selling an idea and buying an idea or transferring items in between. End of the day, it is the same thing, whoever does wherever in the world. So, it gives a comfort level for both the buyer and seller on both sides of the table when they comfort themselves and start getting into the terms of business. Otherwise, it, it will be a direct term where people may say yes or no. Generally, you find Indians who say, we will consider, we will look into it, we will possibly come back to you, let me think and get back to you. The reason is cutting it into two pieces and putting a decision straight on the table is generally not accepted as an internationally good business practice. 
So how would you advise a Motswana entrepreneur heading over to India to do business? What kind of advice would you give them when networking and to get ahead there? And what should they expect, really, since you, after you've painted such a vivid picture? We have lots of uh, young, talented and educated manpower in Botswana today. And there is a need to make sure that all of them are employed in the right place. For that, I hope Indian businessmen can play a very vital role. When it comes to mentorship and trying to educate in business peers the youth of Botswana, they can do a good job. Because on-job training is very practical. And you will know the difficulties of running as even a smallest business. Mm. So what Indian businessmen can do mm. is to take the lot who are looking for employment to be the trainees, as I speak to you, I, I happen to be the chairman of the India Botswana Chamber of Commerce. Our team has got an idea of trying to start an entrepreneurship development institute, which is going to supply the competent, qualified, trained manpower mm -hmm. to both public sector and private sector. See, education from university and college is based on the degree or a certificate. But the world outside the college is different. Very different. And you need to know the practical implications and complications the moment you get into your real daily life. Mm. Indian businessmen can really do a lot of job. And in fact, we have our own programs where we intend to take Botswana in each private company to ensure that they are being trained. And then they can go fly in their flying colors and do their businesses. The India Business Chamber of Commerce and Industry, IBKI, has facilitated a number of visits by delegations of Indian businessmen. What does our guest, as chairman of the chamber, tell those he encourages to seek out opportunities and invest in Botswana to expect with regard to the way we conduct business, having lived and worked here for a number of years? Well, there are lots of positive side which we need to present to whoever is coming into Botswana. Mm. Yes, we have our own problems, but we don't want to wash our dirty clothes outside. And we need to represent the talented youth, educated youth. You've got private universities, you've got the University of Botswana. And the youth who are educated in Botswana today, I should say with pride, they are well informed and well educated, mm. who are youth today who can come into various organizations and do. We always say all over the world that you, you have got an accessibility to 200 million population, which is the Sadak region. Mm -hmm. We need to manufacture here, export outside. And to manufacture, what is needed to be done? By private sector as well government, mm -hmm. they need to come together. Mm -hmm. In fact, we do the same job. Mm -hmm. We act as a catalyst. We are the representative platform. Mm -hmm. We recently had the privilege of accompanying His Honor, the Vice President of Botswana, to in India for a business delegation. Okay. And I believe it was quite successfully uh, expressed opinions by all the people who have come in the delegation. And we are looking for investors to come in and explore. We need to market Botswana. It's a small place, but it is a powerful place. It is, it is not landlocked, as they used to say earlier. It is land-linked now. You can take the goods from here to all over the world. Okay. And we have a potentiality of the neighboring countries we need to take the advantages from their both experiences, maybe sometimes from their failures, we got to learn lessons. Then we can overcome those issues. So you think practical experience anywhere can equip you to do business anywhere else? Botswana right now has to concentrate on export promotion and import substitution. Whatever you are importing, if you can locally produce or you can produce items which you can export to the world to get foreign earnings. You will be really successful. And there are lots of schemes. Government is also encouraging. And we, we should be thankful to them by making proper use of them. Sometimes there is always a gap between the way policies are made and they have been put into practice. And we always hear comment in the public, oh, there are no jobs, economy is not doing well. But at the same time, what is that you can do to better the things? What is your little role which you can play successfully? And especially today's youth, they are, they are well informed and well educated. 
communication levels are on the world speak. IT, internet, laptops, you know, you call websites, Twitter, Facebook, everything. So, the whole world is one click away if you are the right person to get the knowledge. The treasures of knowledge and the think tanks are around the world. All the successful leaders, you can try to read them and get to know from them. And even people who are around you, you can try to take their experiences. Definitely practical experiences oriented with a successful businessman is always going to make Botswana a very good entrepreneurs and leaders. Okay, in your time setting up business in Botswana, was there anything you had to adjust to? Any times there were cultural clashes, whether they ha may have been challenging or even funny? Um, any miscommunications as you try to adjust to how people operate here? Well, we, we earlier, it's about 20 years back, 20, 25 years back, we used to find the receptivity levels were very low. When you got to explain a person to do a job, maybe if, if somewhere else you can get the job in one hour, Maybe you need to give time two hours. But now, after 25 years, I have come to a correction that once you teach a Botswana a job properly, he does it for a lifetime. And now, off late, the challenges are different. Well, I, if I have to be vocal, I always say that the investment which we are doing in the field of education must produce the real talented, educated, Competent youth, sometimes we have issues of on-job training. You can find youth having degrees and diplomas, but sometimes their performance may not be up to a level. So, this is not what is the problem with the youth. It is with the institutions, the policies, the syllabus, then the education which they receive. So, we need to have a proper monitoring system when we are funding the institutes to see that the turnout from such institutes and universities will really be useful to the immediate industry. Any best practices um, we could learn from India? Well, we are together. India and Botswana is having ever since uh, Botswana's independence in 1966. There is a, an exchange program from the military services to the education, to the health and to the IT sector. Lots of Indian doctors, Indian chartered accountants who have been on the very prime positions. And all of them have imparted their skills and training to Botswana to a great level. And as a quality or an etiquette or a formula of successful businessmen from India, it is it differs from one to one. It is it is more observed and learnt. Mm -hmm. And it's always an opportunity to meet a Botswana who is successful. The same way is to meet an Indian businessman who is successful. And I hope that lots of Indian businessmen have trained a number of people here and we are still there to do. You can see in the institutions, educational, health and other facilities, we have lots of Indian professionals who have excelled and, and really gave back to the society. And as a chamber and as a businessman, in, in my own small, the Automaster group, whatever we intend to do, we got about 75 to 100 citizen employees. I always tell them, it is a challenge between you and me. I would like to take the best from you and you would like to learn the best from me. Go ahead. This is how I say. Because we believe in sharing and caring. That is the culture which brings you, you know, a peaceful and a successful and a happy life. End of the day. Whether you are a businessman or you are an employer. Do you have any questions to ask or comments to add to any of the conversations we got started this evening? Feel free to engage us and other viewers of the program on any of our social media platforms. Until next week and another issue of interest, I, Namitso Samakula, the team behind First Issues, and our sponsors, First National Bank, wish you a good night and pleasant viewing.